uh, Dr. Caleb Naimi, I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. Um, he's a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy, the academic dean at Birmingham Christian College, and lead pastor at Sparkbrook Eden Church in Birmingham, uh, UK. Um, he's married uh, with a few kids. And so uh, he was on Zoom a few months ago, I believe. And so uh, we welcome uh, we welcome him this morning. I hope that he's not uh, too down because his team lost uh, yesterday in the uh, in the World Cup. But uh, I'm sure as a man of God that will not affect him at this point. So uh, so we welcome uh, Pastor K. Dave this morning. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, well, it's good afternoon from here. I suppose it's good morning from there. Can you all hear me well? If you can hear me in the house, can you just wave? Great. Wonderful. I know those online can, can hear me. And so I'm glad that those of you uh, in there can also hear me. And uh, you, you're right. You know, the spirit of God has lifted me. So I've not been affected at all yesterday with the defeat of England. I wear two hats, you know, and both hats have been taken off. Um, so I'm from Ghana originally, and Ghana was knocked out earlier in the World Cup. Uh, and then last night also England. So God is saying to me, only support Jesus. And that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> Amen. And I know Canada, you were also out uh, some time ago, just like Ghana. So we, we all, we're all in the same soup uh this time of the year it's great to be with you great to be with you again online i said to the folk in in our church this morning that you know very soon very soon we'll make a visit to canada and, and see you all in in person that is great to be with you uh online again and um, we we were with you not so long ago um when we we spoke i think it was on baptism and so we are very happy and blessed uh, to be with you again this morning, uh, which is afternoon, our time. And, and the scriptures that we uh, that was read to us by our dear sister, thank you very much. And she spotted that in terms of the promise or the prophecy and its fulfillment, the prophecy and its fulfillment. And that is what I want to speak um, into or speak about this morning, your time. And it's about the miracle of Christmas, the Christmas miracle. We in that season now, um, we thank God with all the things that have uh, happened throughout the year that by the grace of God, we've made it uh, a few more days left or two or three weeks and the year is ended and we're praying that God will see us through. But as we come around this season, um, just want to encourage us once again and lift us all up once again with the Christmas miracle. And also to encourage somebody out there who is waiting for a miracle and to encourage you that miracles still happen. Amen. Miracles still happen. God has not gone to rest. God has not retired from doing miracles. God is not tired from doing miracles. Christmas reminds us that the miracle working God is still at work. Amen. He is still at work. And so if we begin from Isaiah, um, that prophecy in Isaiah, I'm speaking from the Christmas miracle. That is the topic that I'm speaking on, the Christmas miracle. In Isaiah, we read chapter 9. That story sort of starts from about chapter 7. And is a triangle. A triangle, you have God, then you have King Ahaz, and then you have the prophet Isaiah. And so three people in the conversation in those three or so chapters that we're reading about. And some of you already would know that, of course, when the Bible, uh, the books were written, there were no chapters, there were no verses, they were added later. And so it was written as stories and narratives and prophecies for us to 
pick through the chapters and verses sometimes are helpful sometimes are not if you want to understand a full story read the whole story and not just a chapter but what is happening with the life of king ahaz is interesting ahaz was not a very good man ahaz would not be a popular president today or a popular king nobody would really want to serve under ahaz he was quite cruel and um, he was not godly he did not obey god's word and he was uh, he, he, he loved to worship idols and wander away from god but God, who is still merciful, God who is still merciful, decides to help Ahaz. And this is how sometimes when you think about the mercies of God, you realize that not just Ahaz, we also don't deserve his mercy, but God is merciful. God is merciful. He is kind, he is generous. Christmas reminds us that God is indeed merciful and God is still having his grace and his compassion on us. In fact, three days ago, I, I, was, I was almost contemplating getting in touch with Roger and saying I might not be able to make it. On Sunday, my head was full of cold and, and sneezing and coughing. Um, but thank God, um, I'm a lot better, not 100%, but a lot better this morning. And, and it shows that God is merciful. <laughs> Amen. It shows that God is still good and God as our sister who prayed, is still answering our prayers. And so God decides to help Ahaz, who is now being attacked by the enemy, and tells Ahaz that you have not been good, but I will still help you, and, and reassures the people of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, that don't be afraid. When Ahaz heard that the enemy was coming in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 3, I like the way the NLT puts it. Uh, verse 2, it says that they, their hearts trembled with fear like trees shaking in a storm. Very good way to put it. Is that their hearts, the hearts of the king and the people trembled with fear like trees shaking in a storm. That is how terrified they were. But God spoke to them. He spoke to them through the prophet Isaiah. And he said, don't fear. Verse 4 in Isaiah chapter 7, he says, tell him, stop worrying. God is telling somebody this morning, stop worrying. It's coming around to Christmas, the birth of Jesus as we celebrate the miracles happening. Stop worrying. Don't fear. God is still in control. God is still in the business of doing miracles. And so whatever you're going through this morning, whatever you're going through this season, the encouragement that God is speaking to us through the prophet is don't fear. Don't worry. God is still in control. So God strengthened Ahaz and the people through this. And he promised them of a son that will be born, the sign of Emmanuel. And so that Emmanuel came. That Emmanuel was born in that time, but we know that that was not the one who was to reign forever. It was a sign. And then in chapter 8, the Assyrians are coming again. There's more bad news coming for Ahaz and his people. And, you know, sometimes when I was going through this story, I, I was just thinking through how sometimes in this world that we're living in, we, we sometimes get a season of bad news after bad news. We, we get a season of one thing after the other. And in, in our own church here in, uh, in Birmingham, England, we, we had a season, a, a very difficult season where our church building went through a, a lot of re, refurb, not because we wanted to particularly, but because we had to, because things were breaking down. Um, and from one thing to another, we had to fix the whole front of the building. And just as we're finishing, our boiler also packed in. Um, and then even last night, the electric's gone. And we're thinking, how are we going to cope this morning? Because we had a baptism this morning. And we were on the, on, on, on the brink of canceling that. But in the last hour, God stepped in. The boiler, which had not been working for three weeks, giving us a lot of problem, all of a sudden started by itself. 
the electrics which had gone off all of a sudden came back again. And so this morning we're able to have the baptism services in a nice warm church and God was glorified and people were blessed. Sometimes we have seasons of one thing after the other, but God is always in control. And so it's to encourage you that you may have had maybe a year of turbulence, of difficulty, of challenges, but don't let that knock you off your feet. Steady on and press on in the faith and believe that God is still at work. Amen. God is still at work. And so while God was encouraging the people, people with this message and this news and telling them that even though the coming Assyrians are going to cause trouble, Ahaz, who is king, who was quite um, an unpleasant king, in the midst of all these, God is preparing a king. God is preparing a ruler. God is preparing somebody who is going to reign, not reign like Ahaz is because Ahaz is a wicked king. But God is preparing a ruler who will reign, one who come from the lineage of David, from the lion of Ahaz. But he will be a king like no other. And this is where we come to in chapter 9, which we read together a few moments ago. When he talked about the people walking in darkness. When he says, nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. In other words, the seasons that we go through, which are difficult, which are dark, which are heavy, which are stressful, they will not go on forever. A time is coming when the king is bringing deliverance. The king is bringing light. The king is bringing hope. And we are not looking to an earthly king, but we are looking to a king who will reign on David's throne and will reign on it forever. What a comforting message that the prophet brought in a time of difficulty, in a time of challenges. We know the whole world. I, I don't have to be in Canada to know that there are difficult seasons for us all in the world right now, you know, rising um, living cost and difficult decisions that governments are making, unpopular ones and, and injustice and, and all sort of things that are happening. The, the Christianity, which is under attack in all corners of the world in, in the things that we are going through. But yet, the good news is that a king has been born for us. A savior has been born for us. He says the season that we are going through will not last because in the season of darkness light is coming light is going to come through that is the message of christmas uh, there is light and there is hope and there is deliverance there's rejoicing even if it's ahaz on the throne even if it's the assyrians whoever it may be whether it's russia ukraine whoever the oppressor might be a king is coming and that king is already here, and his name is Jesus. So there's a promised king in that prophecy that we hear in that triangle, that trilogue conversation with God and Ahaz and the prophet bringing in that comfort and all those comforting words. He said to him, and this is what the prophet said, he says, verse 6, for a child is born to us, a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders, He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, the two things which I want us to notice here, and we'll jump into Luke. The two things is this. The promised king is human. So he says a child is born, a son is given. So here he's talking about the humanity of the king. Why is this important? If the king is not human like us, he will not feel our pain and he will not be able to help us. If, if, you know, sometimes, you know, we, 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 we say that people who are in high places don't relate to us. When, when it comes to elections, you see the politicians, I'm sure they are the same everywhere in the world, including over where you are. 
You know, when it comes to elections, what did they roll? They, they roll their sleeves and they wear their t-shirts and jeans and they, they come onto the, the, the streets and they, they almost want us to think as though they are really one of us. And then once they get in power, they get back into their suits and their ties and their bodyguards and their armored vehicles. And we don't get to see them again for another four, five, six years. But the king that Isaiah talk about is a king unlike them. He's a king who will be born in a manger. He's a king who will be born in a smelly place. He's a king who will be born in a place where the poor people can go and see him. He's a king who will be born in a place where he's accessible to people like me, people like you. People can just go in and say that we've come to worship the king, the humanity of the king. And then two, so he says a child is born, a son is given. So the emphasis on the humanity of the king, and then secondly, the divinity of the king. This is awesome. The king is not only human like us, but the king is divine, is more than human. Why is this important and why is this comforting for us this morning? Because being human, he can identify with us, which is amazing. But being divine, he's able to help us beyond what anybody else can do for us. Our human friends, our family, our loved ones, they all help us to a point. And then they cannot help us anymore. They, they can only do so much. You know, sometimes you, you really, really want to help. And, and it's not that we want to disappoint people, but we simply cannot do too much. I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago when, and they were talking about so many things and I just put my hand up and I said, I said, listen, folk, we are human. We cannot do everything. They want everything done so quickly. And that's the world we live in, in fast food and fast delivery and fast services. So we're only human. You can push the human so far and then they'll break down. And I remember one time I was so tired. It was a Sunday um, afternoon or evening like this year for us and I'd finished church and had several other meetings got home and had to eat and then go online to other meetings and and so by 9 p.m I I was absolutely tired but I remembered I had promised somebody to call them and so I didn't want to let them down and so I I got my phone I think it's in the charge I got my phone and I put it on loudspeaker by my ear and I was just relaxing on my settee. And then I called this gentleman back who had some issues that he wanted help with. And being human as I am, as we started talking, as hard as I try to keep awake, as much as I empathize with him and what he was saying, and I really wanted to listen through and help him, my eyes were going, my eyes were going. I was tired. My strength was gone. I couldn't do anymore. And I found myself sleeping on the phone call until my wife came and said, hey, get up. The person is still on the phone. <laughs> you see, it's really a case of us trying our best to help people, but we're only human. The child that will be born, the son that will be given is not just human, but he is God, meaning that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what any of us can do for each other, beyond what our families, our wives, our husbands, our brothers, sisters, our church leaders, beyond what anybody can do for us. This king is God. This king is God. And this is what brings us to Luke. And we get to look where this king is about to be born and things are happening because these events that I'm talking about happen about 700 years before Mary. And so you can almost forgive the people for thinking that perhaps God has forgotten about us because there was a season and a period where God appeared to be silent. And I say appear to be silent because God, even when he appears to be silent, is still working. 
God, even when there, there doesn't seem to be things happening around us, is still working. God works in diverse ways. He works in mysterious ways. His ways are higher than our ways. We cannot, we cannot compartmentalize God and put God in a box and say God only works this way. We cannot always imagine that God is going to do it our way. He will not and he does not because the Bible makes it very clear that his ways are higher than our ways. And the best part of all that is that his ways are perfect. His ways are just. He is sovereign God, sovereign over us, sovereign over his creation, and he's always in control. Nothing takes him by surprise. So 700 years after this promise, there's a young maiden, a young lady, a young virgin, Mary, her name, as we all know very well, is sitting there, minding her own business. She's betrothed to get married to a man called Joseph. But they're not married yet. They're not even living together. They have not had that marriage consummated. Joseph has already said, and in some cultures still do that today, I got to find out myself when I, I went back, as I said, to um, where I was born, Ghana, um, in the summer this year. And I had some amazing time, especially with my grandmother, who told me a lot of stories that I didn't know. One of them, including how my granddad, um, you know, promised a young lady that he was going to marry, marry her. And, and so these things happen even in cultures, you know, where... Before the child is born, parents will make arrangements. I will marry your daughter. You know, sometimes when the child is born and the child is young, says, I'm going to wait. I'm going to work hard and build houses and build my farm, etc. And when your daughter gets to the age of marriage, I will come back and marry her. So Mary is spoken of. Spoken to Joseph has already got that nailed. And so no man is touching Mary. Mary is waiting for Joseph. And so Mary's carrying on with her business. And we don't really know much about Mary until Luke tells us that in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Mary's cousin Elizabeth, God sends an angel, this angel Gabriel, to Mary. And the angel goes to Mary and says, Greetings, Mary, you are favored. What what greeting? I mean, what what I I I I can't imagine what state Mary will be in, you know, to hear that she's favored when she hasn't done anything, and she's wondering why am I favored, and what sort of greeting is this, and who are you, and and the angel tells Mary, you have found favor with God. And then the angel goes on and tells Mary, something is about to happen. The angel tells Mary, you are going to conceive. You're going to give birth. And you're going to have a son. The child that you're going to have will be called the son of the most high God. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. Isaiah said this. That he will reign on David's kingdom, reign on David's throne. He will be called mighty God. And the angel tells Mary, the son you're going to have is the same one that Isaiah prophesied about 700 years ago. It is about to happen. And so Mary with wobbly knees, and trembling knees, doesn't know what to say. Because as far as Mary is concerned, it is only, it is only a human activity that brings conception. She doesn't know Joseph. She hasn't seen Joseph. She hasn't met Joseph. She hasn't been in the same room with Joseph. And so Mary then asks the question, how can this happen? I, I, I hear what you say in angel, but how can this happen? 
And one of the things I want us to bring to your attention this afternoon is this, that faith speaks into our present realities. Faith it speaks into our present realities. What was Mary's situation? Mary's situation was this. She was a maiden. She was a virgin and there was no way she could be pregnant. Unheard of. And it's almost like somebody telling, uh, telling you, you know, somebody who has not even got a job, that you know what? By this time next year, you're going to have your first house. Wow. You haven't even got a job. You haven't got your first paycheck. And they're telling you that by this time next year, you're going to have a house. It is somebody telling you that you, you, you just about to start your exams, but they're telling you that by this time next year, you're going to have, or you're going to be the manager of that company that you're working for. It is, is somebody telling you by, that the, the, by this time next year, you have a pastor in your church and the church is filled with people and God is doing amazing things for you come day Baptist church. And he said, but, but how can this happen? We haven't even got a pastor. That is faith. Faith is speaking into your present reality that you see what is happening around you, but God sees even beyond that. Faith is not just speaking into your present reality, but faith speaks beyond your present reality. That is what the angel was telling Mary. Mary, at present, you haven't even got a man. At present, you're not married. At present, you haven't had any, any sexual relation for you to even think of being pregnant. But faith speaks beyond your present reality and tells you something will happen. And this is what you're saying is so the faith speaking into the future says that you will conceive. You will give birth. You will have this. Faith is telling us this morning that you will overcome, you will make it. Your prayers that you've been praying for, God will answer them. Faith speaks into the present and then it speaks beyond the present into the future. Does Mary look to the future? Because nine months from now, a baby is gonna be born. 33 years from now, that baby will be hung on the tree. And, and then thousands of years after, there will be this man in Birmingham, England, will be speaking to a church in Canada because of this baby who will be born called Jesus. Because of the cross, because of the blood, because of what this baby is doing, is speaking thousands of years into the future. That is faith. And that is what the angel said to Mary. And that is what I'm encouraging you with this morning, my friends over there listening to me. Faith is speaking beyond what you can see. Sometimes we limit our vision, we limit our expectations only to what we can see. And we can see that next to me, there's nobody. We can see behind me, there's nobody. And so we start to scratch our heads and we're thinking, when is God going to show up? The Christmas message. Is a message of hope, is a message of faith, is a message of miracles, is a message of impossibles becoming possible because God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we can think of or even imagine. Faith speaks into the promises of God. I like that. Everything the angel said had already been said. The angel was not telling Mary anything new. This morning, what I'm telling you is not new. It is what God has already spoken about to his church. When Jesus, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And so when we sit in, even this morning, and we're still praying for a pastor, you go to Jesus and he said, Jesus, you said you build your church. 
So, Lord, we need a servant here right now to come and serve and lead this church. When you are going through sickness, you said in your word that by my stripes, you are healed. And so what you are standing on, faith speaks into the promises of God. What has God said about you? What has God said in his word that you're struggling? Some, some people are struggling to sleep and you're not having a sound sleep. And then his word says that he will keep in perfect peace. Those whose minds are steadfast on him. Says he will give you a peaceful sleep, you know. He will make you have a good rest tonight. If you haven't been sleeping for a while, I want to encourage you that based on the promises of God, that you will. That if you're going through the challenges and the struggles of life by the promises that God himself, it is God who declared it in the garden. The promised Messiah started from Genesis. It did not start in Isaiah. The promises from Genesis chapter 3, when God himself spoke about the seed of the woman. And God revealed himself to Abraham. When Abraham and his wife Sarah had passed the age of conception, God reminded them and used that miracle to remind his people that he has still not forgotten about them. And then in the same uh, history in Numbers with Balaam and Balak and God confirmed his word through them. When the prophet said, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not, he, not near. A star is born. A king is born. A scepter is in his hand. Talking about Jesus. David. The Lord revealed himself to King David, second Samuel, and when he tells him that you, your son, will sit on your throne forever. Yes, it's not Solomon. No, but we're talking about Jesus. He reminds them in Nahum. He reminds them in Isaiah. He reminds them in Zechariah. He tells them that, but you, O Bethlehem, though you are small, out of you will come the Messiah. And all the angel was doing was telling Mary, Mary, the promises that God has already spoken about are about to happen. Those words that has been said ages ago, those prophetic words that has been spoken about even before some of us were born. They're about to happen. That is the message of Christmas. It's a message to encourage you that no, no matter how long you've been waiting for, Christmas is a reminder that the miracle will happen. The miracle will happen happen because God is a miracle working God. God continues to work his miracles even today in our lives, even today in our lives. So Mary asked the question, angel you've spoken, Let, let's just say I believe you angel. Here's the question now angel, you tell me something I don't know now. How can this happen when I haven't known Joseph? And this is a powerful, powerful, powerful statement that the angel makes in Luke 1, verse 35. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. How can this happen? How would this miracle happen? And all the promises of God that he has spoken over your life and in your situation, over your circumstance and all the things that you're going through, how can it happen? It can happen because, and it will happen because the Holy Spirit will make it happen. The Holy Spirit will make it happen. It is not by our might, he said to Zerubbabel. It's not by your might, it's not by your power, but it's by 
my spirit, says the Lord. The miracle that you're waiting for, the story that you're waiting for, it's completion. The testimony that you're looking for, it will happen now. It will happen because the Holy Spirit will make it happen. It will happen because the Spirit of the Most High will overshadow you. You know, sometimes we have so many strategies, you know. We like strategy this and we make these plans and we make those plans. And we like to, because as humans, we, we, we need to see the picture. Hmm. We want to see. And, and when we don't see, we are not convinced sometimes. And that's what happened to doubting Thomas, isn't it? And Jesus said, blessed are you when you believe without seeing. And, and, and sometimes we want to make sure, you see, when, when the angel went to Abraham and said, yeah, by this time next year, your wife, Sarah, conceive and have a baby. And Sarah laughed. Says, ah, I've gone past, gone past my date. That's not going to happen. Sarah didn't see it happening. If somebody tells you that by this time next week, this will happen in your life and God is speaking to you and says, yeah, well, but I can't see it because all we can see are the letters from the doctors. And we, we, see, we see the notifications on our phones. And we see the things that, you know, from Facebook and the WhatsApps and the Twitters and the Snapchats are telling us we're not seeing beyond them. And God is calling us this, this morning to look beyond what we can see. Because the Christmas story tells us that miracles are still happening. That wonders are still happening. That God is still in the business of doing amazing things. And he does it how? Because of his spirit. The spirit of God will come upon you. The things that you are waiting for today, this season will happen because the spirit of God will make it happen. The power of the most high will come upon you. And I like how the, what the angel said, he did not just say the power of, of, of high or the power of, he said the power of the most high God. In other words, the power of the incomparable God, the power of, of the God whom no one can understand, whom no one can compare to, this powerful God, his power will come upon you. This powerful God, this awesome God, this most high God, his spirit will overshadow you. And will make the miracle happen. That is what I want to encourage you with, folk, this morning. God will make it happen. In Isaiah, he uses a word which I love so much in Isaiah 9, verse 7, just at the base of that scripture we read. <clears throat> Excuse me. He used a word. It says, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I love that. The zeal of the Lord Almighty. In Luke, it says, the power of the Most High. Isaiah, it says, the zeal of the Lord Almighty. And you see, zeal in the, in the Middle East, in the Near East Asian world, they use the word zeal to talk about the jealousy of the gods. And so when gods are in battle and, and they talk about zeal, they say that the God is jealous, who jealously guard what belongs to, to the God. But for the Hebrew, they chose and they use this word zeal to refer to God's intense love, God's compassion, God's commitment and God's dedication. Now I'll, I'll, I'll repeat those. God's intense love, God's commitment, God's total dedication to you and to me. So he's saying that he will cause the miracle to happen in the church, in your life, in your situation because of his intense love, 
because of his commitment to you, because of his dedication to you, the zeal of God. God is committed to making his plans come into fruition in your life. That is what he means. God is committed to make it happen. And so nothing in this world, Paul reminds us in Romans 9, he says, nothing, Romans 8, nothing in this world, neither scheme nor height, no principality, no demon, no sickness, no famine, no sword, nothing will separate us from the love of God, from the plans of God. God is committed to making his plans come into fruition in your life. God is committed to making his plans work in your life. This is the message that he gave Mary. The spirit of God will make it happen. The zeal of God will accomplish this. That is how the miracle will happen. Not because we've got it all planned out. Not because we've worked it out. One add one will make two. And three add two will make five. And we work those out in our human minds and understanding. But we are dealing with a God. who can use five loaves and two fish to feed 5,000. We are dealing with a God who waits for Lazarus to go in the tomb. And still steps there and says, Lazarus, come on, get out. Let's go for dinner. We are dealing with a God who, when Paul and Silas are bound in shackles, creates and causes earthquakes. And he says, come on, get out, fellas. And they get up and baptize prisoners in their households. We are dealing with a God who, when doctor says that your time is up, God says, I have not finished with you. And he's still working with you because he's got a purpose for your life. This is the God we are dealing with. And he says his power and his spirit will make it happen. That was the answer that he gave Mary. What is our response as I begin to draw my message to a close? God is still in the business of doing miracles. Christmas reminds us that miracles still happen. The prophet Isaiah gave the prophecy. He talked about the king who was coming, his humanity and his divinity. And then the angel appears to Mary 700 years after and tells Mary, Mary, the time is now. The time is now. And this morning I came to tell you the time is now. The miracle is happening. God has already started doing it. It is happening right now. What is our response? And I'll bring this to a close. And the response is what we learn from Mary in this passage that we read. <coughs> Excuse me. The first thing we need to do, and this is what Mary did. Believe in what God has said about you. When the angel went to Mary, he said, greetings, you are highly favored. God is saying that you are favored. God is not saying that you've worked hard to deserve the miracle of Christmas. No, God is not saying that because you've prayed all night. No, no, even though it's good to pray all night sometimes. God is not saying that because you read the scriptures every day this year, he's going to bless you with some additional bonus. Not necessarily even though it's good to read the scriptures every day, but God is saying that you are favored because of his mercy. You are favored because he's a gracious God. You are favored because he has called you. You are favored because he loved you. You are favored because he is a good God. Believe in what God has called you. Believe in that. The angel went to Mary and says, greetings, you who are highly favored. He didn't just go and say, greetings, Mary. No, that would have been an ordinary greeting. Mary would have been used to everybody go, hi, Mary. Hey, Mary. Hi, Mary. He says, no, greetings. You who are highly favored, believe. Number two, the second thing I want us to take from this is this. 
Look at what God is doing in, in others and be encouraged. Look at what God is doing in others and be encouraged. <clears throat> Sometimes we get a little bit caught up in our own little bubble. What do I mean by that? Sometimes we only look within. I've been having this problem all year. Nothing seems to be working. I've been having this challenge all year and nothing seems to be happening. No, 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 no. There's something is happening. 138, you know what the angel said? 136, what the angel said to Mary, he says, even your relative Elizabeth in an old age is already six months pregnant. In other words, God is already doing the miracle. In other words, God is already showing his power in our lives today. You may feel that things are not happening well in your life, but remember that God is still at work. Look at what God is doing. Sometimes don't just look on the news or Facebook or, or WhatsApp or whatever media that you go on and only look for the bad news. Look for the miracles God is doing in other places. Look for the testimonies that other people are sharing. Look for the churches that God is doing amazing things and say, God, you are doing it there. We are encouraged because you can do it here also today. Look for the good news story because God is working and be encouraged by the good news stories and realize that if God is able to do it for them, he is more than able to do it for you also. Let somebody's good news, let somebody's miracle encourage you to persevere, to press on, not to give up. When somebody comes and tells you, now, I just said like we, did, we, we didn't even know we'll have a service in our building this morning because all of a sudden everything just breaks down last minute. But we have a service. And I said that to encourage you that the same God, it's not a different God, the same God. The reason why I'm here sharing this with you is because I believe in the same God that you believe in, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the same God would do it for you also where you are. He is faithful. He is good. He is kind. He is merciful. Look at what God is doing in others. The angel said to Mary, Mary, don't be afraid. God is already doing his work. Your cousin Elizabeth, is already pregnant because God is already at work. Number three, believe and accept God's word. There's one thing believing it. There's another thing accepting it. James tells us, even the demons know there's a God. But have they accepted him? There's one thing believing. There's one thing knowing. There's another thing accepting this is what Mary said in verse 38 of Luke chapter 1. I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may your word to me be fulfilled. What a powerful statement. To this young, young virgin who stood the risk of being stoned in that culture for being pregnant without having a man. The shame and the disgrace in that culture at the time that that would bring to Mary. She risked, risked her life. But when she heard that this is from God, she said, I'm the Lord's servant. Praise God. I'm the Lord's servant. Hallelujah. May your word come to me and be fulfilled. That is the message. That is the hope, that is the faith that I want to stir up in you this morning. Baptist Church, come day over there. Take that word. Believe the promises. Just like Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. May the word come to fruition. May the word come to be, may the word come to what? Fulfillment. 
The angel said, for no word of God will ever, will ever fail. The word of God will never fail. For no word from God will ever fail. May it be fulfilled. And then, finally, surround yourself with people of faith. Surround yourself with people of faith. That is the final point that I want to encourage with you in terms of what is our response to what God is doing this Christmas and what God is about to do in the new year. Surround yourself with people of faith. Believe in what God has said about you. Not what people have said, but what God has said. Number two, look at what God is doing in others and be encouraged. Number three, believe and accept God's word over your life. Accept it like Mary did. And number four, surround yourself with people of faith. You know, there's a section just after what we read, verse 39 to 45. Mary took the words. And he says, verse 39, at that time, Mary got ready and hurried. Not to anybody. You know, these days, some of the, the younger ones out there, as soon as we hear the, the news straight on the, on the Facebook, on the Twitters, and the Snapchat, and the Instagram, you know, we, that's where we publish our news immediately. Mary didn't do that. Do you know why? Because there are thousands of people on there who sometimes may call themselves friends, but are not. There are people who be smiling at you, but are not smiling inside. There are people who will give you a hug, and because your face is there, they are trying to stab you in the back because you don't even know that they'll be doing that to you. There are people who want to hear something from you and then use the same things against you. Mary did not go around shouting to everybody. She would have been dead if she did that. You know what she did? The Bible says she ran, she went to the hill country of Judea and she entered the house of Zachariah and she met Elizabeth, another woman who was filled with faith, filled with the blessing of God. In her womb at that time, it was John the Baptist. And you can imagine those two babies when the two women, the two mothers come together. Jesus, and John the Baptist embracing even in the womb. And the Bible says the baby left in Elizabeth's womb because she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ, the mother, Mary, had been there to see them. Surround yourself with people of faith, with people who will encourage you, with people who will lift you up, not people who will bring you down, even when you have news of hope and of faith and of favor from God. Remember this, my friends. Christmas is a time of miracle, a season of hope, a season of breakthroughs, and God is still working even today. God bless you. Have a good, good Christmas. And I'm sure God willing, we'll meet again in the coming year. God bless you and be encouraged that God is still doing his work. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Caleb. Um, as you were as you were speaking, that phrase came to me when um, when they're on the road to Emmaus and afterwards they uh, Jesus was revealed to them. And then after 
uh, they said, did not our hearts burn within us? And this morning I felt like that, you know, my heart burned within us as, as I listened to God's word this morning. And my, and my my soul was refreshed and my spirit was refreshed this morning with God's word. So I praise God. Amen. Uh, we'll just uh, we'll just quickly uh, we had a, re uh, a request for a song this morning, so I will do it. Uh, number if we can stand and sing number four twenty eight. I need thee every hour. Amen. 